So the title of my talk <coughs> excuse me, is Learning Everywhere But School. Actually, I changed the title. And I changed it to represent what I think are my complicated feelings about school and a lot of people's complicated feelings about school and about how learning and school relate to each other and where learning happens. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to talk about what I'll call the entrenched infrastructure of typical K-12 through schooling and that it creates two related problems. The first problem is this, that the materials and associated practices of what I'll call industrial education disengage and alienate students. And second, this entrenched infrastructure makes it difficult to sustain innovative learning experiences that seek to overcome this disengagement and alienation. So a lot of us now have come to recognize the undesirable effects of industrial food production. That's the famous pink slime of late. But what about the undesirable effects of industrial education production? So I want us together to take this analogy seriously. And this is, I'll ask these two questions. What does it do to young people's health to mostly consume food in the form of fast food and packaged products? We've come to understand that as an important question to ask. Now let's ask the analogous question. What does it do to young people's interest and engagement to mostly experience learning, what counts as learning to them in schools, in the form of worksheets, textbook problems, and graded tests? So if I had time, I would spend a few minutes telling you stories about my own kids. And I'd tell you about how when I tell those stories about my own kids, other parents tell me stories about their kids. And then I would ask us to think about what stories would the kids tell us. And then I would tell you that my kids and these kids all go to good schools, not massively under-resourced schools. So I want us to think about these forms, and I want you just to look at them for a second in an aesthetic way. Is that the sort of thing you want your kids or any kids regularly consuming? Second problem is what I am calling the sustainability of innovation problem. My complicated relationship with schools, I spent a lot of years of my career trying to make these innovative things happen in classrooms. Those are two pictures from National Science Foundation funded projects where we tried to do really interesting things. The first was a project-based math classroom and the second was we were trying to help fifth and sixth graders connect the ideas of making arguments in science and history and seeing them as similar and different. What happened with both projects, and this happens routinely to colleagues in my field, is that people work very, very hard as a team to bring an innovation into a school. But what happens is that we leave, our money leaves, our people leave, and the innovation is swallowed back up by the infrastructure of school as usual. Now, there's good things that happen in school as usual, but this is a problem. Okay. So it, given these two problems that I've just posed, where else do we look? And I'm going to argue that we look in what this picture represents as the sea of blue. What you see there is a diagram that I put together to show how much time people spend across their lifespan, and that's in the orange, in formal school subjects. Now look at that in relation to the rest of the waking hours people spend in their lives. Now this is just meant to be a conversation starter, but what it does tell us, it, it allows us to ask the question is, how did we allow school to become so important for us to think about learning? And there are other questions this can ask, but let me move on. So what you find in the sea of blue, um, across the course of my work, I've done work in science museums, I've studied professional architects, population biologists, I've studied kids um, I've studied families and how they understand and learn about money. I've studied kids using media and I've studied kids in preschools. That's about half of the field sites I've been in my career. I'm going to tell you about one of these studies because it sets up where I'm going at the end of the talk. This is a study about kids playing video games. Now most of us aren't that interested in the content of video games and I perhaps wasn't that interested in it as well. But I was interested in what happens when kids play video games and how they learn when they play video games. So 
in these top three frames, you see three examples of something that we think we found in the studies that we did, which was that kids, peers, even siblings, when they're really interested in doing something, find ways, and I hear resonance with what Mike was telling us, kids find ways to teach and learn together. And so I'll give you just one example here. On the left side, uh, we have two young boys and a young girl in the back, and the person in the far back is my um, colleague and field researcher. The two boys routinely play a console video game together. They're brothers. As they're playing, their sister is often watching. She's at the periphery of this space. She wants to play, but she's not as experienced as them. So she sits on the periphery of that space. They have found a way to include her as an apprentice. And the way she is an apprentice is that the two boys will find a place when they've gotten to a slow part in the game. They are just waiting to level up in the game. And they'll stop the game. They'll pause it. They'll bring her in. They'll hand her the controller. And now she becomes the person who gets to drive for a while, getting feedback verbally from her brothers. She'll level up. They'll pause the game again. And out she goes to the periphery again. So I'm telling this story, and I could tell five or six or eight others from this very same study, and we've written a little bit about this, about how inventive kids are in finding ways to learn together when they care about things. So this is the only, as a professor, um, we often give presentations that have bullet points. I guarantee you this is the only bullet point I have, and we're going to move on to a video. So here's the, some of the things, the punchlines of what I've learned in the years I've been doing this kind of work. I've learned that learning experiences can be interest and identity engaging. They can be interest and identity building. They can be peer supported, not just teacher supported. They can be supported by more variable forms of teaching and support than typical in schools. Learning can be something, and this was an, again a resonance with what Mike was saying, learning becomes something young people can see for themselves not waiting to be told by the grader a score, and that learning can make productive use of failure. So these are some summary points of things that I've learned in the work that I've done. So here's the question it poses. And this is where I'm back to thinking about schools. Can we design, implement, and sustain learning experiences that have these qualities? So where I'm going to end is to share with you a project that um, we started at Northwestern and has its home, in part, here in Evanston, at the Evanston Township High School, and at the public library, and in some of the public spaces downtown. Um, it's also in the Chicago Public Schools. The video is about six and a half minutes long. It tells the story, it tells the first chapter of the story of this project, and I thought no better way to say how I've tried to put these things in place than to bring this, a project that's in Evanston's backyard, interview here. It's not hard to see why today's youth aren't more engaged with science, technology, engineering, and math. Even if they are fortunate enough to have a passionate, well-prepared teacher, our school system can make learning even the most fascinating STEM topics a tedious exercise in memorization. It's not that youth can't get interested in mastering complex, challenging tasks, especially when those tasks require creativity and innovation. We just have to take the interests of young people more seriously. The question is, where do we start? One place we can get inspiration from is video games. Games are very engaging for most young people, and researchers have shown that they involve complex, often collaborative problem solving, precisely those skills at the core of productive STEM activity. I mean, all, all a video game is is problem solving. It's just a series of, if you think about it, in some weird way, a video game is just an assessment. All you do is get assessed every moment as you try to solve a problem, and if you don't solve it, the game says you failed. Try again, and then you solve it, and then you have a boss, which is a test and you pass the test. I mean, games essentially are a form of assessment, the thing that is probably the most painful, ludicrous part of schooling. Uh, but in a, in a game, it's a lot of fun, right? Because it's handled in a very different way. At Northwestern University, we are using these insights about gaming to design a wide range of interest-driven challenges. 
We call this project U-STEM because it seeks to connect the interests of youth to STEM through a carefully designed set of challenges. What makes our approach unique is the way we organize these challenges. Since young people are interested in many different things, there are lots of entry points. Each challenge is designed to be immediately accessible and engaging, much like the first levels in a video game. These entry points serve as hooks, piquing interest in a challenge. Our challenge design encourages kids to move from this initial interest into deeper engagement. As kids level up, the challenges get harder, requiring them to apply knowledge and skills from previous levels. Those who make it to advanced levels can earn badges as a formal recognition of their skills. This supports kids moving from hanging out to messing around to geeking out, from participating because their friends are to participating because they've developed a genuine interest. There is a lot of help and support available for completing a challenge, but only on demand. Kids can ask a coach for help or use online tutorials or videos. To complete a level, an individual or group of kids posts a video or other artifact to a social media site and records their accomplishment on the achievement board. Some challenges award bonus points for solutions that are especially creative or elegant. For example, in Robot Mini Golf, any team whose robot completes all the levels in a single turn without needing reprogramming earns double bonus points. In school, failing is bad. Failure is a source of perpetual anxiety that causes students to be very conservative and risk averse. It also is a big turnoff for all but the highest performing students. In U-STEM, failing on a challenge is really just another try. Failing is an opportunity to learn and improve, not something to be avoided. Our format supports interest-driven exploration. Kids can explore a wide range of challenges in a risk-free way, and then geek out and go deep on challenges that they're interested in. So far, the reactions have been positive. I already knew that this is going to be fun. I already knew that for sure. Because like when we had the robots and the Legos, I'm like, okay, it's going to be fun. One of the most memorable for me probably was when we made the music after we created the um, the circle machine. This one thing that we made could do so many things and knowing like we made the machine, well, we didn't make the motor, but we made the motor able to do these different tasks. It, it ended up working pretty good. Like I kind of liked how my tower turned out to be and that was kind of cool. So like when we got number one pass, the number two was kind of easy too. Then three, same kind of simple as you, all you have to do is hit the ball strap and then go over the bridge. Then it started to get easier. Then I see that, like, we use number one. I'm like, okay, then we doing something right. I think it gave us a lot of creativity. Like, it gave us a lot of freedom to do what we wanted and create something that's completely our own. Now we're tied for second. I think we are to be tied for second. And it's, it's real fun. I like it, you know. I like to do this again. Yes! Yes! As you might imagine, this approach to STEM learning requires a very different approach to teaching. In U-STEM, teachers and other experts play a supporting role. We want to have youth pull the information they need, rather than have it pushed on them as it happens in school. As a coach, uh, as a resource more than a direct instructor, yeah. I think everybody, nearly all teachers would enjoy doing that. They're all working in, you know, in their pairs, but each one, you know, is discovering things at different times, and to see their faces light up when they figured something out was really just great to watch. U-STEM will also require a very different kind of space to learn in. Our inspiration is U-Media, a teen-only space in Chicago's Harold Washington Library that was designed to support the hanging out, messing around, geeking out framework. We're working with local high schools, the Chicago Public Library, and other partners to try out U-STEM. Later on, we plan to scale up to a large number of schools and community sites. Our efforts so far are just the beginning. We envision a growing universe of new levels and challenges that engage kids in STEM learning. As we continue to design and test new challenges, we are excited about the impact the U-STEM experience has had on youth and its possibilities for the future. I began with a comment about how I have complicated feelings about school 
Um, this is a partnership with schools and with community-based organizations and the university and corporate foundations. And for me, this is the way to get a sustainable innovation going. And with that, I'll 